Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon. It's an edition of Scene Missing. Great to see everybody. And uh, this is John Suntress, the host of Word Balloon. And I'm happy to introduce a couple of our panelists. Uh, we're waiting on Hillary Barta. He'll be joining us shortly. But uh, in the meantime, uh, happy to welcome back Will Pfeiffer. Good to see you, Will. Hello. And Mike Cronenberg. Mike uh, has been on Word Balloon before, but this is his first scene missing. Of course, uh, Mike very well versed in the world of cinema. He is part of the uh, Noir City organization and magazine. What is your title over at Noir City, Mike? Film Noir Found. It's the Film Noir Foundation, actually. Pardon me. Uh, I'm the gra graphic designer. There you go. And also great graphic design for uh, Tomorrow's on uh, Back Issue and mm -hmm. uh, some of their other books and issues. And of course, the author, co-author of the Batcave Companion. So it's it's good to see everybody. And, um, you know, let's see. I Well, first of all, I, I started off by playing uh, my slightly more, uh, I wouldn't call it modern because it's still 50 or 60 years old, or old in terms of its content. But uh, I, I've got my uh, noir lobby card uh, intro, and that was one that had kind of 60s and 70s movies, a few 80s movies as well. But uh, I don't know. I love. I miss lobby cards. I always loved them as a kid. What, what's great about lobby cards is, and my brother is like this big collector of uh, film posters and 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 uh, and film memorabilia, and lobby cards is just so easy to hang up. You can get mm -hmm. a lot of them, you know, and hang them up. Whereas a poster. And I'm looking at right now, I've got a French, big French three sheet for the good, the bad, and the ugly. And behind me, I've got an Italian three, like three sheet for, the, for Dirty Harry. So in those places, you could hang probably like nine lobby yeah. cards, you know? I love I've that. I've got so. a lobby card back there for Girl on the Run. You probably can't see it, but it's that little rectangle in the background. And then uh, the hypnotic guy is... A lobby card right up here. <laughs> wow, you get you. Well, you might know uh, from Chicago and stuff, but one of the great places to get lobby cards was down the street from Wrigley Field on Addison, a yep. little, little place called Yesteryear. And Yesteryear is closing. Didn't it just close, or it's yeah. closing, or yeah? Because they're they're you know I mean the real estate there is becoming so important, and I'm sure the guy just cashed out, and I'm sure they gave him a ton of money yeah. to go away, and it's a shame because. Uh, you know, and Mike, you'd appreciate this as well as a, as a boxing guy, you know, tons of great uh, boxing press kits and magazines and stuff like that. It was just this great little flea market of a store. Just tiny little building. Yeah. Not, yeah no more. Yeah. Those are going, you know, I mean, because of the pandemic too, you know. I mean, just, sure. I mean, used bookstores, all kinds of used bookstores, of course, comic shops too. So yeah. Really sad. It is sad. And, you know, as we're talking, I know Hill, when he joins us, he's such a massive fan of, um, you know, seeing the movies in the theater. Well, obviously, with the pandemic going on, uh, it's tough to see some of these obscure movies, you know, regardless. But but thankfully, I know Amazon Prime. It seems to me that of all the streamers, Amazon Prime is probably your best bet to see a ton of great old movies that I'd agree. get neglected. Yeah. Yeah, they're the best. I think they've got the best collection. Although I have to say, HBO Max has a pretty good collection. They have a um, TCM kind of collection. They have like a DC collection, and they have like different. But their TCM collection, which is a little odd at times, that some of the movies that are in that TCM section. I was like, okay, I don't think this is a movie that would be on TCM. But they had um, things like some of the Melville. Um, French noir films, mm -hmm. um, a bunch of those, um, uh, a lot of Kurosawa stuff. Um, so, and there's a lot of film noir in there. Um, good old, some good old movies, um, some B films, some stuff that you wouldn't normally see. Uh, things that were in the Noir City, we've had in the Noir City Film Festival too. Nice. That's cool. You know, I was telling uh, the guys before we started uh, getting on the air that uh, now that Peacock is up and fully running, I have Xfinity Comcast, so I have access to the premium Peacock. And I gotta say, for being Universal's streaming service and the 100 plus years of Universal films, I'm a little disappointed in the classic film selection. I mean, there's stuff there, and there's decent, there's obvious stuff there, and there's a few that I wouldn't think are, you know, n normally uh, that people would think of necessarily to hunt down. But I, again, I think you got a hundred years. You've got seventy years of television, mm -hmm. universal television, and I'm like, where's? I mean, from a TV standpoint, I'm like, all right, where's Banachek? 
where all those shows are from the fifties. Are you doing the pay thing where you're paying? No. The, like, if you pay the monthly, all the classics are on there. Well, that's I, what I, I heard. I'm not paying the monthly, but someone told me that the Universal Classic Horror Films are on there. Oh, they and, are. are. Well, they? because you no, know, it's interesting, and I'm glad you, you mentioned that because I would have forgotten. They have all the Frankenstein's. They have all the Draculas. I didn't see the Wolfman up there, and maybe I missed it. I saw Creature of the Black Lagoon, but the two sequels I didn't see up there. Mm -hmm. and, and I do have, as, as if you've got premium Xfinity, you have premium uh, ha uh, Peacock thrown in. Oh, okay. See, I don't, I don't have, I don't have the premium. So, yeah. I, that's and, but, and it's yeah. So I'm, I'm confused. I mean, and, and as I understood it. The free version of Peacock with commercials has about 7,500 titles total. Premium has over 10,000 currently. And, and maybe they they're going to roll Banachek? stuff out. They don't have like Banachek and they don't have Heck Ramsey and the Snoop <laughs> Sisters. <laughs> You're reading my mind, Mike. That's exactly what I was hoping for. I just told the Benson sisters, Julie and Shauna, about the Snoop Sisters, and I sent them the links of the three episodes I found on YouTube. I used to watch that show when I was a kid. Me too, man. That's hilarious. I watched all those Sunday night. It was like Sunday night, right? It was a Sunday night mystery movie. And, and Thursday, then, as I remember. It was Thursday. two nights a week. Yeah. Heck Ramsey. Remember Heck Ramsey? Absolutely. Richard Boone. Banyan. Supposedly uh, Paladin as an old man. Really? In the, in the series, he says he was Paladin when he was. And they even, I think, incorporated clips of the uh, Half Gun Will Travel show. Uh, wow. So yeah, and Banyan too, man. Banyan was part of that. Was yes, that wasn't Robert, that uh, Robert Forster? And it was set in the thirties, right? Right. It was kind of a noirish crime thirties uh, detective drama with uh, with Robert Forster. I've never seen yep. that. Yeah, never heard of it really. All right, looks like Hill is going to try and join us, and we'll see. There he is. Let's uh, let's bring in our fourth panelist for tonight, everybody. The surly hack himself, it's Hillary Barda. Good to see you, Hill. There he is. Hey, guys. Hey, Hill. Good to see you, Hill. How's this sound? Yeah, it's okay. You know something? We'll let Hill. I'll tell you what. We'll uh, we'll like direct to you, and let you uh, talk about some of the things you want to discuss. And uh, yeah, so we'll try not to talk over you as you're talking. I say that, but I'm sure I'll be the first one to uh, <laughs> screw up and talk over you. So, well, if the sound isn't good, I can just drop out. You can, I can... No, you sound okay, Hill. Go ahead. And no, and uh, you know, I mean, I, I, you, I know you had a great topic that you wanted to discuss in terms of uh, obscure movies that we don't initially think of. Okay. okay. Well, why don't you go ahead? I'll, 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 go ahead. I'll listen. To them. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll come back to you. It's cool. Okay. All right. We'll um, come back. God, I'll tell you, you know, uh, the um, movies channel with an exclamation point is pretty good in terms of uh, having uh, stuff being a. Well, now I'm hearing a weird uh, delay. Well, now I'm hearing a weird delay. And it's and it's really long on you. I was going to say about the movies channel that. Um, here, I'm, you know, Hill, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mute you, and then uh, when when uh, we'll we'll let you talk, we'll all be quiet. There we go. There we go. Well, let me try it one more time. There we go. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Actually, no. That 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 delay is still there. And forgive me, folks. It's me. Uh, for people who are watching, uh, if uh, if you let us know if uh, you're hearing any sort of delay, and if it is, if you don't hear it, then I'll I'll do my best and just you know, you know, ignore it. But uh, Craig Gorman wanted to let us know that uh, he's going to watch in the morning. He's hoping we get into some Bogart talk. I'm sure there's always room for Bogart talk. I was starting to say the, the movie channel Movies, that's a great channel. Um, they have uh, commercials, but they show amazing movies. And, and Hill and I have discussed it. Sundays and Thursdays, they do, they do nothing but noir. But, man, it was a good day today. They had um, Captain Blood early in the morning, and they had Mr. Roberts in the afternoon. And usually during the daytime hours, they show a lot of great old movies and stuff. And Hill, I've never even heard of this. Is this just the movie, the movie channel, the cable movie channel? Is no, it's it, it's called Movies with an Exclamation Point. And I know Hill's a big fan. I'm gonna I'm gonna unmute you, Hill, and let you talk about it. But it's uh it's a digital channel. You know, if you have a digital antenna, and most cable systems carry digital the sub channels. So 
Hill, talk about uh, talk about movies and uh, what you've been seeing lately. Well, uh, Michael, you'd like it. Uh, Thursdays is all noir, all day long. That's great. And also Sundays, uh, they play noir. That sounds yeah. good. With this sound, I'm getting a serious echo when I'm Yeah, that sucks, Hill. I'm sorry, man. Hell, I'll tell you well, what we'll do. We'll do it. We'll do you and me uh, talking. Uh, yeah, honestly, next week, if you want, we'll find a day. Because uh, I'm sorry. Okay. About yeah. No, no, no. I don't know what's going on, but it's really difficult. I apologize to everybody. I'll be All right, man. Yeah, sorry. We'll see you, Hell. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, yeah. Anthony said Echo's gone after mute. And then, yeah, no, it's not. And he said Captain Blood is fantastic. I agree with that. And yeah, we tried, man. Um, so he'll he's gonna hang out and listen, which I'm I'm totally fine with as well if he wants. That's fine, man. Yeah, all right, you know, and you got you got the mute on, so that's that's cool, Hill. Um, there you go. <laughs> he'll gonna hold up signs for us, and uh, he'll, that's right. he'll, he'll do it that way. Hold up the little cue cards. <laughs> it's all good, man. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a great digital channel. And um, they run movies uncut. Um, the only thing I've ever seen them do was uh, they ran Catch Twenty Two, and they opaqued uh, the nudity. Oh, okay. And that's the only that's the only like censorship that I've noticed. But and, and they might bleep. I don't know if they bleep or not. Is it? Or, the, I mean, it is it commercials? Does it have commercials? Yep. Is it kind of like one of the like the cozy TV or one of those where they? But but with movies instead of old TV shows. Oh, like, so. Yeah, okay. like Me TV. It's yes. and it's the same company as Me TV. It's Weigel, oh, okay. named after Tim Weigel, a uh, uh, ABC, a local ABC broadcaster here in Chicago that set up a nice uh, company for himself before he passed away. Yeah, I cut uh, I my cable cord, and I'm just doing all apps through Apple TV. So I wonder if they have an app. I know I do run. Um, I have YouTube TV for my like network stuff, you know. Uh, so oh, the actual YouTube, the, the the new original stuff that they're creating. No, they have like they have like a a way to access different channels, YouTube TV, so you can get NBC, CBS, ABC. I know what you're about. That because I want because of all the sports I watch, and they have um, TCM. Um, so that was my oh, way. Really? The they have the cozy, and they have what is the name of that sci-fi <clears throat> sci-fi channel? I forgot. That's similar to Me TV. It's oh, um, Heroes and Icons. No, um, oh, I can't think of the name of it, but they had that. So maybe they'll add the smoothies channel. Yeah. Too. Well, they, you know, and that's interesting if there is a sci-fi a specific sci-fi channel because Heroes and Icons is the one that runs. All the Star Treks uh, six right. nights a week. Mm -hmm. Like in, a, uh, they'll run one of each in a little row. Yeah, that I don't. We don't. I don't get that. Um, I'm trying to. I can't. I, I. It'll come to me. I can't think of it. I don't watch it only because it's not like high def. It's got commercials. And it's like, yeah. I, I can't. I know. We get spoiled. <laughs> point in my life. It's like there's no way. The only time I'm watching commercials is if I'm watching a live sporting event. You know, and that's it. I understand. I understand. Again, I know um, you know Hill's watching um, the the meet or rather the movies they show on on that channel is amazing. And I mean, God, I saw him. It was with uh, Cag. Was it Cagney and uh, no? It was Bogart and Betty Davis. And uh, Betty Davis was like uh, in a prostitution ring of some sort. And Bogart was a DA. I can't remember the name of it right now. I wish I had written it. Down. No, no, but no, no. a lot of obscure stuff. So, you know what I finally saw, Michael, was the original Kid Galahad with uh, oh, Edward G. Okay. Robinson and Betty Davis. And Betty Davis, right? Yeah. yeah. Edward G. Robinson. We covered that in Ringside Seat. We had an article that was written about that. Um, yeah, so, yeah, Curtis film. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I like the remake. I like the Elvis remake. I like the remake, too. Yeah, I, like right. I like the Elvis film. I really do. Agreed. And yeah, I, well, you know, A, A. Johnson is uh, here and he says TCM is one of his go-to channels. And we can understand that. It's terrific. Another thing I saw, it's sitting on my DVR because I really want to sit down and give it my full attention when it plays. 
They had a Roger Vadim documentary a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Oh, I'd like to see that. Yeah. Very interested in that. So let me ask you guys if you saw on Eddie's North City, and I talked to Tom King, who I'm, we're friends with, um, and Address Unknown. No, I, I don't think I, so. I, we, I had never seen that movie. I had never even heard of that movie before. And Eddie showed it, and this is probably maybe a few months ago. Um, and it was, it took place in, it takes place in the States at first. And um, this German, who this older German guy, I'm trying to remember the actor's name. I'm gonna have to look it up on IMDb. Um, he goes back to Germany just around the time, like right before Hitler comes into power. And it's all about how this family, and he has ties to friends who are still in the States. He's actually an art dealer. And how the guy who goes over back to Germany becomes kind of a, a statesman among the German government and how it becomes more more fascist and how he changes his how he is and the daughter of his friend comes to germany because she's an actress and she's in a traveling show mm -hmm. and what happens i mean it's really dark and it's really sad and it just is really a testament to how easily and quickly people can turn and how fascism can take over um, uh, in a country. I mean, it is, and it just, and it's also got this incredible twist um, uh, that involves the title. And I really don't want to give it away, but um, I really recommend if anybody can find it. And I'm not sure if it's on Amazon or not. It could be, um, but I'm sure at some point TCM will show it again. Eddie, I, I only know it's been on once. Eddie showed it that one time, and it was really great. And it wasn't recently because it seems like Turner is leaving their movies up a lot longer than they used to. They used to always be like, most of them would only be like seven days. And it seems like a lot of the movies now are up for at least a month sometimes. Because I uh, I was watching, uh, they did an, a whole day of the RKO Falcon movies. Mm -hmm. And I love those. Uh, both yeah, the yeah, Sanders yeah, ones and the Tom Conway ones. And um, I had missed, uh, or I'd missed most of one of them and uh, it was one where um, Ed, Ed Brophy, one of the great character actors oh, that I wanted to talk about tonight, um, played Goldie Locks, his uh, sidekick. And it was just, you know, I mean, he, he carried all the humor and he was just fantastic. And I'm like, oh, damn it, I missed it. But then I was looking at uh, the library and it was still up there and it had been a couple of weeks. And I'm like, oh, great. So I watched it then and man, yeah. I, you know. This, was, this movie now, it, it, it starred Paul Lucas. It was directed by William Cameron Menzies. Oh. Who was, you know, one of the greatest, you know, uh, art directors, you know, and directors. I mean, he mm -hmm. did Invaders from Mars, which is a favorite. Oh, that's an incredible movie. Oh, yeah. Um, and this movie, I'm telling you, the look of it, because he also was involved with the look of it, it has really this, the, the, the sets are very expressionistic. Um it's a really amazing movie. I, I I cannot recommend it enough because it took. It's one of those movies, and you guys have probably experienced this too, where you have no expectations, you have no idea what the movie is about or what it's going to be, and you end up watching it, and it's like, I can't believe this. No, yeah. It's such a great movie. You want to tell everybody about it. Um, the last. Well, it almost feels like the last time I felt like that. The movie was when I saw, and I'm sure there's been others. Was when I saw Cutter's Way for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a good one. And it was like, I saw it on Showtime. It was on Showtime. I didn't know what to expect. I was like working construction. I was like 17 years old and I was working construction and I came home, I was tired. I'm gonna watch a movie. He's like, I don't know what this movie is. I'll watch it. He's like, holy shit, this fucking movie is great. So um, I, well, I can't recommend Address Unknown, you know, more, it's great. Well, A. Johnson is saying that he found it on YouTube. Oh, so that's, that's great. great. Address unknown. Fantastic, man. Very cool. No, and I, you know, I, I want to see more of Paul Lucas. I haven't seen a lot of Paul Lucas movies and stuff. You know, I'm fascinated yeah, by that second tier of, of leading men. Right, for yeah, the, yeah. 
the second tier studios. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's awesome, man. How about you, Will? What's, what have you been watching lately that's uh, entertaining? Um, I just got the – Warner Archive had their sale, and I just got the, the Blu-ray of Mystery of the Wax Museum that they've released, uh, completely restored and revitalized, and it, it looks amazing. Um, 1930 – let me check out the year real quick. 32, uh, I think. 33. 33. Is it yeah. 33? Okay. And it's if if you've never seen it, I, you, I'm sure you guys have seen it. But if people have never seen it, it was filmed in a process called two strip Technicolor, which is a really almost gives it like a dreamlike feel. It, a sort of all reds and greens are the colors that you see. And it it used to I I saw a print before and it was pretty rough. And they, oh, I mean, it's incredible what they did to this. It looks like a whole new movie. And I love this movie and uh, Doctor X, which was also filmed. I think a maybe the year before in two strip tactic color. And, um, because you know, it's, it's a, it's a horror movie from the early thirties, but it's a Warner brothers horror movie. So you get the mixture of like the fast talking reporters and it's real urban. It's set in the cities and you get the great Warner's supporting characters, but with horror elements, which you usually don't see. And, and it's cause you know, this has the Lionel Atwell plays the sculptor and he his museum in England burns down. And so he, you know, he's disfigured and he's obsessed with Fay Ray because she looks like his Marie Antoinette figure. So you have that whole plot, but then you have this great other plot with uh, Glenda Farrell as the fast talking reporter. And she you know, she's, she's, she's uncovering their, I'm um, what? She's really fast, talking. really fast talking. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and it's just a lot of fun. There's, you know, great dialogue and it's all very pre code in its, you know, looseness with the law and you know there's bootleggers and there's crooked cops running around and and it looked the whole thing looks amazing i'm not sure who designed the sets on it i'd have to look it up but the, the sets are incredible it was a big budget movie and it just looks great there's so many shots of the wax figures like melting and in that color it just it looks so bizarre and it's oh it's it's really good yeah, it's, it I, combines I love, two of my favorite genres i love that movie and it's got Lionel Atwell in it. I mean, mm -hmm. Atwell, well, you, you know, there's Doctor X, and then there's murders, the murders in the zoo. Right, right, right. Which was also filmed like pretty close to that time period, also. I think. I know I, it's not too strict. No, but it's, but. and that has murders in the zoo has one of the most incredible openings for an old movie where Lionel Atwell sews a man's mouth shut oh yeah it's you, like, you know so sadistic it is it's brutal so dance is, is sadistic um but you know Lionel Atwell god nobody talks about him anymore he's just he's so great in everything he I is mean, he, shitty movies you know I mean uh he, he wasn't he it. in um what, voodoo man with Bell Lugosi and or and George Zuko maybe yes not, maybe. yes I, it, I think so yeah. I think that's the one I'm thinking of you got George Zuko Bell Lugosi and Lionel Atwell in a movie together you know what I mean it's like you know, I, don't, always, I don't care that it's a cheap you know poverty real horror movie it's great yeah and I mean in this one he you know he's a tragic figure for much of the movie and right. you know before he turns sort of into the villain at the end but it, oh he's he's great and of course, just, it was remade as House of Wax, you know, right, with Vincent Price, three D, and uh, Charles Bronson. Right, Charles that's right. Bronson. I forgot the, about that as Charles the Bronson mute, and, as the mute, um, as the mute sculptor, murderer slash murderer. <laughs> I love that movie, and I love and this, both movies. This actually. one also has Frank McHugh, who is like in a million great, you know, I think he, he's in. Uh, 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 Footlight Parade. I mean, he's done tons of Cagney movies playing, you know, the second banana and that. So, yeah. So I highly recommend it. And it, you know, looks great. There's a nice restoration feature on it. So you can see just how much work they did. I what hope they do Dr. X next. Extras to it besides... There's a couple commentary. Tr There's at least one commentary track. Oh, There's really? a restoration feature. There's a feature on Fay Ray in it. I think that's about it. But it's good. It's a I, it's a nice little package. Their their podcasts were so irregular. I'm not even sure if they do them anymore. Uh, I don't. Warner but man, I used to love listening to the Warner Archive mm -hmm. podcast because all those D.W. Ferrante and I forget the other uh, host names, but they would do panels as well at San Diego and in New York Comic Con. And and my God, these I mean, obviously they're they're in the in the department that's restoring these movies. But they really it, it was a pleasure listening to them. 
because they really know what they're talking about. And um, yeah, yeah. Uh, these these films. I'm so glad these films are being you know uh, restored. Yeah, yeah. it's. Not, I mean, because yeah, you that. you know you hear about the death of the physical media, but it's nice that they realize there are people like me who really do want that stuff. And oh, oh yeah. And you know, I just got a new TV because my old TV went, and it's like I decided, okay, I'm going to go out. I'm buying physical media. I'm buying movies, and I went and bought that Criterion. Uh, Bruce Lee collection. Oh, and, uh, oh, yeah, I saw you two on yeah. Twitter. Yeah, how is that? Uh, is it, I haven't started incredible. watching it, but I am halfway through Matthew Pauly's uh, excellent Bruce Lee biography, which is like 700 pages, but it's fantastic. Wow. Yeah, um, this- and then I bought uh, the Godfather collection in Blu-ray because I, I didn't have it in Blu-ray. Um, I bought... God, I got the setup in Blu-ray. Um, what was that sitting in? The setup. Oh, oh, fantastic, Robert Ryan! I've still got I've got that on DVD, but oh, that's such a great movie. Um, what else did I get? Would you agree, Mike? Is that the best boxing movie, hands down? In my opinion, it's the best boxing movie. Ever. It's incredible. Yeah. It's, it's so one. tense, and it feels so. Oh, it's, uh, and it's and it's the whole time thing, you know, the mm-hmm. fact that it's it's, it's in real time. time. Yeah, close well, enough to Robert, it. Robert Ryan. I mean, you know, yeah. Robert Ryan's one of the greatest actors in America. Yeah. Incredible. Well, and sadly, when you go to local fights when they had them, of course, pre-pandemic, um, not too different from 70 years ago in terms of the venue and the creepy fans. And, and you know, yeah, I mean, it really I, – I, I covered these for 16 years for Boxing Illustrated and radio as well. Um, yeah. it's So, no, I, I love the setup. Mentioning Bruce Lee, though, I want to – oh, hey, go ahead, Mike. And then no, I'll, I just wanted to agree with what you, and the point that you made, John, because this really is true. We, in Ringside Seat, in the boxing magazine that I do, um, we, had one of, we had a boxing photographer, and we asked him to go ahead and take a, 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 an event, not, not a big one, not one of the big boxing events. And all I, all I wanted him to do was photograph the audience. I said, and I wanted you to do it black and white. Oh, nice. And so th- it was just a, f- it was an entire photo essay just in black. And I tell you what, 1949 <laughs> with, with the setup and, you know, 2017 when we did that, the only <laughs> difference is the dress and what people are wearing, you know? <laughs> it was really amazing. What's I so, agree. In the setup, it's so great how they kind of cue, I forget, is it the, Blind man or blind, but you're like, oh, the nice, kindly blind person's walking in, and then as bloodthirsty as anyone else. And he's got the, and he's got his friend describing everything right. to him, and he's what, just like, ah, oh. yeah. And then there's the, and then there, and then there's the wife who doesn't want to go in. It's played by um, Dennis the Menace's father. What is that actor's name? Oh, I I can picture him yeah. exactly. Right, so look it up. His wife don't doesn't want to go, and she's like, oh, I, I don't want to go in. I don't want to see these. She ends up being the most bloodthirsty. Mm-hmm. That's such a great movie. Unbelievable. And I was, as I'm looking up the guy's name, um, regarding, and this might be a minority opinion, I want to know what you guys thought. Um, the 30 for 30 that they just did on ESPN about Bruce Lee, Be Water. I have to confess, I was a little disappointed because I had seen so many and read so many things about Bruce Lee. It reminded me of when. They made the documentary about John Lennon and his immigration problems. They got everything right. I didn't think I saw anything that I hadn't already seen before. And I don't know well, what you guys I, I tell you, no, I think you're right. I, I, I wasn't surprised by anything. I, actually, the only thing that I didn't know, and I wasn't aware when I saw that, was that Bruce Lee was a star in Hong Kong. You know, I didn't realize that until I saw that, and then I started reading Matthew Polly's book. I didn't realize he was a child star in Hong Kong. But what was great about it was that I ended up showing it to my son and, I, and my wife, and they both really enjoyed it, and they didn't know that much about Bruce Lee. And I think I spoke to a couple of people who watched it and really loved it and enjoyed it, and they, it kind of opened up about who Bruce Lee was. That's I cool. Think- Herbert Anderson, real fast, was uh, Dennis the Menace's father, the actor in. Uh, there you go. Very good. Thank you. I think I showed you this photo, Mike, but um, when I was in Hong Kong 15 years ago, 14 years ago, adopting our daughter, we yeah, took yeah. a picture by the Bruce Lee statue that's, that's in Hong Kong yeah. Harbor, Victoria Harbor. That's awesome. It's great. Oh, and they have you- handprints of like Jackie Chan, Run Run Shaw, Michelle Yeoh, Chow Yun Fat, 
Um, John Wu, all the it's over there. I was going nuts. And my I'm wife reading was about Run Run patient. Shaw right now in the Matthew Polly mm. book because of what I'm up to, and I don't want this. Although I wouldn't mind getting a first week <laughs> conversation, but he he had, you know he made the decision to because everything had dried up in the states for him. There were no opportunities anymore. You know it was so racist um, here, and Hollywood was so bigoted, and they were so narrow minded that they were convinced there was no way an Asian male could ever be a star. Yeah. So that's when he made the decision, he goes to Hong Kong and there was the battle between Raymond Chow and Raman Shaw for his, for him mm. to make movies with them, you know, and he just finished um, The Big Boss, which ended up being uh, like uh, the biggest success in, at that time in Hong Kong cinema history. I have to confess, I love the Dragon Bruce Lee story, you know, movie with um, Jason Scott Lee, and um, yeah, I've never seen that. I like it. I got to admit, it. and then when it's on encore, or whatever, I'll go to it. And then while we're on the subject of, and I don't mind, this is okay to talk about as well. Um, Seventies, uh, you know, Shaw Brothers movies and the and the rest. Uh, that Netflix documentary, Iron Fist and Kung Fu Kicks, is oh, exceptional. Oh my God, it's Is so it great. It covers everything and it really does start uh, in the 60s and set. Well, no, it starts, I mean, really in the Asian countries and what they were showing and stuff. But it really is about the, you know, bringing those films to the urban areas and how they played in all the grindhouse theaters and stuff. And, and but also globally into like Australian markets as well. It's, uh, it's fascinating. Where, where did you see that? Is that available it's, on Amazon? It's on Netflix, and oh, yeah, it's called Iron okay. Fists and okay. Kung Fu Kicks. Great. I'll check that out. So yeah, there's a, a, a great documentary. So and Hill, I, I you know I'll tell you, Hill, if you ever want to like pop in and and wave us down, we'll, we'll you know let you let you you know comment on what we're doing because I feel bad, but I, I'm sure you're enjoying watching. So, <laughs> but anyway. Um, you know, no, and you know, like you were saying before about great care. There he is. You want you want to you want to pop in now? You got something to say? Oh, oh no? Okay, you're just like acknowledging. That's cool. All right, excellent. It will be Bernardo if you know your Zorro uh, continuity. <laughs> Don Diego's manservant that was uh, silent, but there you are. No, I'm glad you're watching. All this is good. Very funny. So. I, uh, what else? I, well, you know, I, I here's another one, and it's a, not a noir, but it really is one of my favorite 50s movies. And that's John Ford's uh, Last Hurrah with Spencer Tracy and Ed Brophy again and James Gleason. That whole crew. Everybody. Basil Rathbone and uh, John yeah. Carradine. John Carradine. <laughs> Everybody's in that movie. It's so that. good. I've never seen that. Jeffrey Hunter. I just, oh, I've Mike, you got to see it. Yeah, I just DVR'd it off TCM again because I wanted to watch it again. It's And it's like so corny in a way but just it tells the story you know so well and yeah it's it's a lot of fun it glorifies machine politics completely oh i mean completely. it's you know aren't they aren't they they're like keebler elves just running around in the in this boston like city it's not boston but it's well. boston <laughs> exactly New it's England. a little smaller than boston i guess but it would have okay that's fair and it's about the encroachment of the new generation and um there's a young uh, kind of empty candidate, but knows how to use uh, TV and newspapers and all the big media and, and the banks are all behind this new guy. And they and there's a whole um, anti-Irish sentiment in the film. Um, and, and, you know, Spencer Tracy represents uh, the Irish, the classic Irish politician. But yeah, all these great character actors. And it's in 1958. Yeah, it's, so it's so great seeing. Ed like Brogan. Jane Darwell's in it, isn't she in it? Yes, John, yes. John Ford. Mm -hmm. John Ford wow. directed it. Mike, it's on Turner uh, to on demand right now. So you know, yeah, if you're at oh, all curious, okay. well, definitely, I will definitely see it. Um, speaking of of Ford, just to go off about other movies that I've watched and I've I've gotten is John Carpenter. I bought a bunch of John Carpenter films because I'm, he's one of my favorite directors. Sure. So Assault on Precinct 13, which of course is a remake of Rio Bravo. Right. Um, and so I got that on Blu-ray, which was great. I love that movie. Uh, and then I got Escape from New York and, and The Thing, which is like a beautiful Blu-ray, which has like enough extras that it's going to take you like two days to get through all the extras on The Thing. That's such a good movie. 
That's awesome, man. No, that's fantastic. We showed the thing to my daughter last year when she was about 13 or so. Wouldn't let <laughs> her see it. We're like, okay. You like it? She liked it, but she's like, that was intense. I'm like, well, yeah, you know. I was waiting. I'm sitting there watching it, and I'm waiting for the scene where they're trying to do the chest compressions on yes. the guy, knowing what's coming, and I'm just watching her watch it. <laughs> yeah, that's the best part of it is when you see when you get to watch the, a movie like that. Exactly. Never seen it before. You end up not watching the movie. You end up watching them. Mm -hmm. You know, I Probably. saw that movie when that movie came out in the theater. I saw it the night it came out. I was just talking to my brother the other day, and I, I reminded him. I said, you know, when we saw it, we saw it. And this was in Miami. The night it came, it was released um, because he and I were always big horror movie fans, mm -hmm. um, and we were the only ones in the theater. What did? Wow! You, it was a total was it bomb. That? It was a bomb. The thing it was a bomb. Blade Runner opened the same week as really? ET. Was that yeah. what it was? Yeah. yeah. Well, and well, it, after ET, it 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 opened like maybe a month after ET. Okay. It was just a bomb. Blade yeah. Runner, and then he and I went to see Blade Runner too. And there were like two other people in the theater when we saw Blade Runner. My mom dropped me off to see Blade Runner because I was too young to get in an R-rated movie. And I was like, one of the only I people in it. I was barely able to get yeah. into an R-rated movie. And time. even then, I think I, I liked a lot of it, but I was also in the back of my head like, this doesn't look like Empire Strikes Back at all. This isn't Han Solo. <laughs> right. <laughs> Mentioning the thing, well, first of all, Brad acknowledging um, Last Hurrah says amazing film, fantastic to see Jeffrey Hunter in something aside from Star Trek. And it was interesting, Mike, I know we're planning on uh, doing a rewatch of Star Trek right. and uh, Jeffrey Hunter came up. And um, I I got to say that I like him in the Ford movies. Um, and, and you know, King of Kings, he's, you know, he's Jesus for gosh sake. He's a good looking Jesus. <laughs> yeah, he's, 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 a he's the Jesus in all those like corny, like black velvet paintings. That's the Jesus he Yeah. Is. Yes, <laughs> totally. But I like, you know, well, I'll save my thoughts on uh, Captain Pike later, but um, I, I'm glad that uh, Brad recognized that it was well, Jeffrey you know, Hunter. Here's a, here, and do you, I, I, if we're talking about Jeffrey Hunter, here's a sure. that I like is Brainstorm. That that noir, that crazy noir, it's like, I don't know if it's considered one of the last film noir movies, but um, I know that people in the Film Noir Foundation or have written about it and talked about it as being one of the last, like, film noir movies. Um, but it's a crazy film, and he's in that. It's, it's a pretty good movie. That's cool. Know that one. That's cool. Is you know, I was going to ask Mike. Like, I'm looking at yeah, 65. It was directed by William Conrad. Right, William Conrad. Right. Wow. William Conrad. Wow. You know, I didn't know that. The Killers and uh, you know Cannon and yeah. Oh yeah. Thirty. Oh one of my favorite. The Jack Webb. We always talk. We always somehow well, mention always Thirty in this movie. We love that. It's, it's a great newspaper mag movie. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, Mike, have you seen that one? Yes, I have. Um, because he's one of my two on a guillotine, he also directed. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, I didn't know that. Yes, uh, wow, he's one of my favorites because he's just such an interesting person. Because he was so great on radio, because he did, of course, Gunsmoke, right? Yes. And he was he kind of conquered movies, he was a producer and he was a director, and of course, he was iconic and the, and the killers. and. And then he was on TV, and you know, Cannon had a long run. I mean, as a kid, I loved that show. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so Eddie Muller keeps talking about, and it, down the pike at some point, I can't wait. He's going to write a, a retrospective on um, on William Conrad. For That's him. outstanding. Oh, that'd be great. You know, and it's funny. I heard Brian Cranston talk about being on a Jake and the Fat Man with him, one of his first roles, wow. and how sadly disappointed he was in the experience. Because at that point, Conrad literally was phoning it in. Yeah, would leave this, you know, had it in his contract. He didn't have to stay. All of uh, Cranston's lines with him in a scene. Uh, the stand-in was was there when the camera was on uh, on Cranston, and just he's like, "Yeah, I worked with him, kind of, but not really." And it was just so disappointed him because he was really looking forward to it. And I always, I'm glad you mentioned it's working radio, Mike, because I always say William Conrad was like the Spencer Tracy of radio. He was so great at everything he did, did, and his voice had such command. Mm -hmm. you, you could not not pay attention to it. He, no, everything, no. whether he was a side uh, actor 
or the or the star of something. I'm a massive and Flame Johnson. Johnson. He was in suspense. He did suspense too. <laughs> and Bullwinkle. <laughs> All right, Helen. Oh, what okay. do we got? No oh, problem. Yeah. We understand. Sorry, buddy. So bye, bud. We'll figure it out. Then you'll be on next week, Hill. Take it easy. Hillary Barter, everybody. I'm sorry you couldn't join us tonight, but uh, you know, technical difficulties in the time of uh, Corona. What are you going to do? Yeah, too bad. So, but yeah, I love Conrad. He's amazing. Um, so I was thinking about another movie that I was watching or movies that I've been seeing. It was Sam Fuller, some Sam Fuller films. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. And Park Row. They yeah. Just got a bunch of TCMs. And Park Row, it's not Park. Do you guys agree Park Row is like one of the greatest newspaper movies ever made? Oh, completely. Sure. Oh, sure. it's amazing. Maybe the greatest. I, mean, I know Citizen Kane is like, you know, like oh. that were made, but man, Park Row is fantastic. So good. I'm kicking myself, guys. Hill was actually in the private chat, like saying things. And I wish I had known because I absolutely, he, that's the note he should have left us because then he could have participated via text. But he, uh, he wrote uh, Address Unknown, was directed by Cameron Menzies. Yes, of course. And uh, talked about Michael Curtis and How to Eternity is a great war film starring Jeffrey Hunter. So there's some good Hillary observations as he leaves us. <laughs> as he leaves us. But uh, that's, yeah. So anyway. Uh. <laughs> Parker. And the other, I think the other great newspaper movie is Deadline USA. Jeffrey. Deadline USA. It's sitting on my TV. Bogart, there's your Bogart. I love it. I bought that Blu-ray like the second it was announced. I couldn't wait for it. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, I love yep. It. And that one is because um I worked. At, I don't know if you know this, Mike. I worked in a newspaper for like twenty years. Yeah, you worked in Rockford. At right. Rockford. I'm still in Rockford now, but yeah, I worked at the paper, and I love Deadline USA because it just covers like everyone at the paper has their little contribution to the you know the sports guy and the caricaturist and the this and the that and it's uh that's such a good one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, man. Great, and it's all about like the death of a newspaper too. So it's eerily timely. And the best newspaper movies are all about the battles that oh, the completely. publisher and, and that's and Deadline USA and also Park Row mm -hmm. are all about that. Park well, Row. and even even in the modern day, I mean, I thought the paper was a nice companion to all yeah. the presidents. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was telling my sister hadn't seen it yet, and I was like, you could fall asleep in the paper and wake up during All the President's Men if it was a double feature and you'd think you were watching the same Yeah, movie. I was gonna mention All the President's Men and um, God, what else? Uh, you no, know, how about, a, here, I got one from the 80s, Absence of Malice with oh, Paul Newman. Oh, yeah, yeah with Sally good. Field and Paul Newman. Yeah, yeah. That's a good one. It. And it takes place in Miami. That's the Miami Herald they, they do. That's right. That's and and Wilford, Wilford Brimley has a great character piece at the end of the movie he's literally in like the last 15 minutes of the movie yeah. and absolutely steals the show oh, he's so great in that bring yeah, us back to the thing of course because you know and, Wilford and Brimley looks exactly what i was gonna what i was gonna say was wilford brimley in the thing yeah and but he didn't really have his mustache it's so weird to see him right. without the stash I totally and forgot here's, here's what's really great on that thing blu-ray is, is that they did um this was shout factory who put this out so um, they do a great job they they do don't they Fantastic. yes um, and they had a, a long interview, current interview with John Carpenter, which was excellent. And then they did a long interview, uh, with not all of the cast, but most of the cast and William, William, Wilford Brimley is in there too. Um, so, uh, if, if anybody out there is a fan of the thing, I, have to check I out. highly, highly recommend that it, and it's not expensive. I think it's like $25, the Blu-ray. Cool. Which is a double disc, and it's got everything. Nice. So you've got so much extra stuff on it. Too. What do you guys think? You know, I was talking earlier today with uh, Mike North, and he brought up the two versions of Cape Fear. And I have to say that the thing and Cape Fear are, you know, two movie properties where, you know, the, the remake is, you know, equal to uh, the, the original. I prefer the original. Um, but yeah, I, I do too. I sure, really like the remake. I like it a lot. Yeah, I mean that's the thing though, and I think for a remake, and especially in this era when most remakes suck, you know, I, I thought. Uh, and also, am I right, Mike? Didn't they use the and then will you likely know this as well? Did they use the original score in both? Yeah, I'm pretty yeah, sure they did. Bernstein yeah, score or some variation on it. 
All right, he's going to join us this way, and I'm glad. I'm so sorry, Hill. I apologize. Yes, I, I, we, I missed your private chat uh, conversation com uh, comments. And in fact, uh, Hill, if you want to come back, I can you know pay attention to that. That's up to you. You have a way of, of coming back in the door. So whatever works. When Scorsese was making the his remake, and he was talking about how, in which he does, you know, he wanted the it to be less black and white. You know, the the family and Nick Nolte and their Jessica Langer, you right. know, they're not as pure as as Gregory Peck was. Polly Bergen. Polly Bergen. But one of the things I like about the original is it's so stark. It's like here is pure good and here is pure evil in there. I agree with you, Will. I mean, I think that's, I think that's it. I think that's maybe the reason. And the other thing is, look, as much as I love De Niro and he's fantastic and he brought something really great to that mm -hmm. character. And Robert Mitchum. <sighs> Damn. Robert well, Mitchum in that movie. With, Those scenes at the end when he's with the daughter, she's so tiny and so, you know, vulnerable, and he's just Mitchum. I mean, it's, but then when Peck turns the tables on him, you feel like he just, you know, it's a stark moment. You know, you're going yeah. to jail and you're going to be in a. Yeah, and Peck, the Peck, the thing with Peck and, and, and Mitchum is just so great. It's much better than, you know, the Nolte. You know, right. the arrow thing that di that that dynamic between the two of them. Oh, it's funny here. Ed says airplane is a better remake than the original Zero Hour. <laughs> <laughs> they had to buy the rights to Zero Hour, I think, to make Airplane, didn't they? I think they did because it's it is a remake, really. I didn't know that. I, didn't know that. I, I, uh, I just. I, heard, no, yeah, sorry, I just heard Robert. I just heard Robert uh, Hayes and uh, Julie Haggerty on Gilbert Godfrey's mm -hmm. podcast talk about that. That they did have to uh, get the rights and everything to make sure that they could make it properly and everything. They must have been so. cheap because I, I can't imagine the rights to zero are we're going for a huge amount. Well, really, <laughs> practically public domain. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when you watch those clips comparing, I mean, some of the dialogue has not been changed at all. It just sounds funny coming, you know. They hey, Will, do, do you have an iPhone or anything about you? Uh, I have, does that can it cause right, any troubles? Okay. No, I was going to say turn your flashlight on. Did you give us just a little bit of, of uh, atmosphere? I oh, okay. You're in the dark, but it's like you. you oh, there, you there go. we go. Huh? <laughs> you go. How's that? There you go. Appropriate. I know. You it's look, just this room of mine. It's I have. There's a light like right over there, so I can see. But there, we'll put that right I, there. I had the same problem. I was talking to James uh, Tinney in the last week or two weeks ago. And I realized, I'm like, I don't want to get up and change my light. I'm going to sit here. And I'm like, oh, I'll use my iPhone and use the flashlight. <laughs> that works. I turn, I have a little light behind me. but uh, yeah, you're fine. This is great. You're like Orson Welles in uh, Tales of the – what was his <laughs> anthology horror show? Remember that? Um, it was like Tales from the Dark Side. But, but he was on camera as like, ah, oh, we're going to see it. Well, I don't really – what was that? that? A horror one? I didn't know that he had one. Was really? it like a – Syndicated or yeah, it was syndicated, and I think it was probably British I'm produced. I'm not familiar with that. I'm gonna look that up as we're talking. You know the one I remember from when I was, I guess, early teen. Maybe it was the Dark Room. Did you guys remember that? With, yes. Uh, yeah. um, James Coburn hosted it. I think. Yeah, I don't remember that. I want to say. I want to say. My, my favorite. My favorite is Thriller. Boris Carlos. Oh, oh of course. course. Yeah. Because man, the stories. I mean, not, not all of them were great. Of course, not everything can be great, but. Man, there's some really great ones. There are some really great ones. Stuff mm -hmm. Robert Block written, right? Know, of stories based on Robert Block stories, and uh, I love that. I wish um, I know it's available on DVD, but um, Amazon has only one thriller episode on there. It's not even one of the really good ones. It's, it's one that's okay. Somebody was, like Cozy or Me Too. Somebody was running those a while ago, and I DVR'd a handful. Me Too. Yeah, me TV was running. Yeah. yeah, Orson Welles' Great Mysteries was the name of that show. It was an ITV produced show, only one season, nineteen seventy three. And I remember either I want to say I remember Benny Hill making a parody of it, and he's smoking a cigar and just coughing because you know Welles was smoking the cigar in the intros and stuff. But yeah, it was great. It was around the F for his F is for fake era. Oh, can I tell you a quick Robert Block story? Just a real Please. quick one. Oh, just yeah. a weird one from college. No. <laughs> when I went, I went to college in the 80s and I went to Kent State and um, 
Michener wrote this book about Kent State, and he claimed that Robert Block got the inspiration for the house that is used, I guess, in the novel. I haven't read the novel in a long time, and eventually in the movie Psycho, from a house that was in Kent. This was a big urban legend in Kent. I've got, Mich- a, I've got a Block story about Psycho too. Yeah, and it's and it's uh and so we would spend all our free time trying to find this house, and we're like, no, it's this one, no, it's this one, no, it's this one, and we got so frustrated. So a friend of mine was going to write an article for the paper about it. And he says, I got to find out if this is true or not. And he said, we should call Robert Block. And we're like, how the hell are we going to get a hold of Robert Block? We're just a bunch of schmoes at a college in Ohio. <laughs> so my friend says, well, you know, Harlan Ellison always brags about how his name is in the phone book in bold letters. Like, you know. So we go to the campus library, get the fo- L.A. phone book. Sure enough, it just says Harlan Ellison and his phone number. So my friend calls up Harlan Ellison. We don't know him at all, of course. We just read his books. Calls up Harlan Ellison and says, can you give us Robert Block's phone number because we want to ask him this. And Ellison, like after a shocked pause, says, no, I'm not going to give you Robert Block's (laughs) phone number. He says, but I'll tell you what, I'll call him, and if he wants to call you back, he can. And we figured he was blowing us off completely. Hangs up. Five minutes later, ring. Hey, this is Robert Block. I heard you had a question for me. <laughs> and the punchline was he said, no, I don't know where Michener got that. I've never been to Kent, Ohio. <laughs> I was like, that, that's pretty funny. You know, here's the story about Robert Block that, I, that I've got is that Monster from the Vault, when we did Monster from the Vault magazine, Tom Weaver, and I don't know if you guys know Tom Weaver. I know, right? I know the name, yeah. He, yeah, he wrote the book Poverty Who Row Horrors. Right. Oh, wow. Wow. Great. I've got that, yeah. So, so Tom wrote an article for us, and Tom wanted to write this article that he'd been waiting to write for a long time, and it was about how Robert Block, that this was true, that Robert Block was inspired as much by Psycho as he, you know, Ed, you know, um, what was his name? Ed um, Gein. Ed Gein. That it was, he was inspired as much by the relationship that Calvin Beck had with his mother. And oh, Calvin, I've heard. Beck was the publisher and editor of Castle of Frankenstein magazine. Yeah. And this is a fantastic article. And he really goes into detail about all of the stuff that went on between Beck and his mother. Which there were a lot of stuff. I mean, Calvin Beck didn't end up eating murder. <laughs> didn't keep her in the basement. Mother, and then keep her in, you know, you know, and like stuff her and stuff. But, you know, it was a very weird um relationship that was very similar to like norman bates and his mother i've heard wow. calvin beck mention i've never read like a full article but i've heard mentioning here and there about calvin beck being an odd dude and yeah. i'll um i'll email i think we had it yeah on, could you, on, i'd on, love to read it link to you yeah, please yeah. see me on that too yeah, yeah. yeah it's pretty interesting it's a pretty interesting article i mean it's available the issue i can't i don't remember what issue uh, it was we had it in but it's Usually on eBay. Um, I'll take a look. Yeah, yeah. If you could send it, I'd love to read that. My uh, one more final thing before we leave the gruesome uh, area of Ed Gein and Psycho. But my um, my mother-in-law worked at Mendona Mental Hospital in Madison, and Ed Gein was a inmate there when she was there. And everyone said he was just this quiet little man, just a quiet guy. <laughs> wow. Did you see Dean? Dean Haspel says that game is my spiritual that. that scares so me. Dean, Dean is totally down me. for <laughs> You know, he was he was on uh, last night on Word Balloon talking about a, a new great anthology that uh, he and his uh, collective of cartoonists made for the Hero Initiative called Pandemics. It's amazing, and people should watch that video. He and Whitney um, Matheson were on, but uh, yeah, Dean is uh, Dean is definitely down for doing seeing uh, missing with us in the future. So. Nice. I would I would be thrilled to have him come on and yeah he's he's an old movie buff. In fact, uh, he as he knows we talked about it last night. His godmother was Shelley Winter. Wow! And he's oh got God. incredible stories of himself as a little kid. Her neighbor was Farley Granger. Oh wow! That's and he's like amazing. you know then what I know now I would have asked them a million questions and yeah. did your old babysat for him? Oh I my mean, God! Just crazy stuff and I'm like Dean. That's a graphic novel. Please make it. That's a complete graphic novel. <laughs> My and one... not to shame it, but it, seriously, I, I, I'm like, this is amazing. And also women would really find it interesting, as you both know, because we know Shelley Winters at the end of her life and career, kind of that old lady kind of blabbing and stuff. And it's like, 
This woman had yeah. such an amazing history. She oh, incredible! Life. I mean, she was she co-starred with like you name it. She co-starred with them, and she also had affairs with just yeah. about all of them too. I mean, Holden, yeah, the top Mar- of my Marlon Brando. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so what was yeah. that story that was going around? I saw it online. I, I, like in the last few months, where toward the end of her career, somebody wanted her to audition, they wanted her to bring a, a headshot and a resume, and she brings a big bag in, and she <laughs> reaches in her bag, puts a Oscar on the desk and says, there's my headshot, puts a second one on and says, and there's my fucking resume. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's amazing, man. Wow. I guess her was roommate for a while, as I remember her book. It's been forever since I read it. Yeah, I think so. so. Yeah. The book I just read in the last... Uh, Six months or so, Mamie Van Doren's book. I finally read her book. Oh wow, that's now she's that's... still with us, right? Um, Maybe yes, 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 yeah. yes. Deed says Vinny Coletta, the great uh, comic book company, New Shell. Oh my god, that's amazing. That is amazing. He, Seriously, didn't, he, didn't he also know like every uh, every gangster, every Italian gangster, and uh, that's, that's the rumor. <laughs> but also, again, I got, he was also the guy who saved. Marshall Rogers and Steve Englehart. I got that straight from Terry Austin when I talked to him when I did Batcave Companion, which I owe a great debt to Will for that because Will, I remember Will was like the, one of the first people to read the book. And I love that book. A great review. I was so, I'm so appreciative. I still am. Oh, thank you. I mean, that. it was oh, incredible. Oh. I love that kind of an obsessive, just, you oh, know, it it's, it's very knowledgeable, but it's so much love is in that book. Oh, I yeah. love it. It was a labor of love. In fact, I was talking to Tom King on the phone the other night. I was talking about Will, and I was saying, you know, I, how appreciative I am that that you did that because it's like that gave the book, because um, you did it for your online for your blog. yeah for my blog yeah uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think a lot and I was able to use that your your review to kind of like promote oh. it. yeah yeah Coletta was just you know Joe Orlando. Hated, and I don't want this to get into a comic book thing. I know it's cool. Um, but Coletta um, really rescued those guys because Joe Orlando uh, was what executive editor at DC at the time in 1977, something like that. He was yeah, some... sounds and right. He hated Rogers and Austin. He yeah. hated Rogers' pencils. He hated he hated Austin's inks, and he wanted them gone. And really, he was screaming at Julia Schwartz, and Vince Coletta was the art director at DC at the time, and he liked them, and he's the one who saved their jobs. I mean, he he, he stood up to Joe Orlando, and sure enough, they got that issue of the calculator that they did in mm-hmm. Detective Comics, and the the letters were ridiculous. All the letters that came in of you know people loving their art, um, and. You know, I guess the rest is history. I mean, at first, Steve Englehart had Simonson do the first two issues of Dr. Phosphorus stories, but, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and then he went off to Europe to write his novel. Um, That's right. And then they gave it to, uh, to to Marshall, who I actually became friends with when he lived in Silver Spring, Maryland. I was living in Alexandria, Virginia. Wow. Um, so Marshall and, and Terry Austin got the job Steve Englehart didn't even know it. He had those scripts written, and he had no idea who was going to draw the stuff. I remember. That's when I was very – that's like when I was first buying comics. And even then, you could there was nothing else like that coming out. Yeah, that's that exactly. Incredible. It was like – especially at DC. Mm-hmm. Oh, like, yeah. He was like this wasteland at that point. It was like especially the art. It was just terrible. And Steve mm-hmm. Englehart coming over to DC was such a big deal. Mm-hmm. A great – Great yeah, because he was coming off like the Avengers, wasn't he? And yep. Captain Avengers, America, Captain yeah. America, that great. We had that great run with where Cap became Nomad. Nomad, and, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Good stuff. Absolutely. Good stuff. And now, yeah. as we stick with magazines, Mike, you should uh, mention that uh, the next issue of Noir City is, is coming out. And uh, yeah. tell us about what's in the magazine. So, uh, yeah, it was released today to subscribers. Um, so. The way to subscribe is you donate to you go to the film filmwarfoundation.org, go on their web on the website, and you go on their on their list, their mailing list, and if you donate at least twenty dollars, you will get a subscription to the e magazine, which is published by Eddie Muller. Ed, and um, 
Vince Keenan, uh, writer Vince Keenan is the, is the editor in chief. And we've got some great writers. Um, and so this issue, uh, we give our annual Modern Noir Master Award. And it was given to David Mamet. Nice. So, uh, and Eddie presented the award uh, to Mamet at, I guess, I can't remember what theater it was at, the Arrow Theater, Arrow Theater. I can't remember where the Arrow Theater. Anyways, they had a, a talk and we published the interview in there. And then also we have a special section um, with a lot of our writers, uh, like Jay Kingston, um, uh, and Vince also writes pieces about uh, Mammoth's career, you know, his time as a playwright, um, talking about his plays, talking about some of the movies that he was uh, hired hand where he rewrote the scripts for, like the remake for Postman Always Rings Twice, and, the Untouchables and The Verdict, and then uh, stuff about the movies that he directed, uh, House of Games and uh, Glen Gary Glen Ross. Um, so uh, it, the nice section about that uh, on that. And then uh, Imogen Smith, um, who's an excellent writer uh, and works for Criterion, actually. Mm -hmm. Wow. She wrote a really terrific piece on uh, Japanese film war post the post-war film war movies in Japan. Cool. Um, uh, and then we have a piece on Joe, Sh the shoot, the shoot, the Japanese, uh, there you go. Yeah. Um, that's where you get all the back issues. Uh, the new issue is not there, but you can get all 28 back of the, of the back issues on. Well, and I already put in too, that the Noir Foundation to get a subscription to Noir City. Yeah, so let me, um, I'm going to actually, if you guys give me a chance, I will read off some of the contents. Please. If you're ahead. letting me plug. Hell yeah. I'm going to yeah. plug. Do it, buddy. Do it, buddy. So, uh, by the way, Mike designs these magazines, and they are just oh, gorgeous. gorgeous. That yeah, and Ringside Seat, they, they really are. They're beautiful magazines. Um, so, Joe Shishido, the, uh, the Japanese action he, action and noir movies. So there's an article about him. Terrific article about uh, Elsa Lanchester. Oh, awesome. Um, uh, article about Walter Hill. Great. Interviewed Walter Hill. Oh, God. Uh, oh, 15 yeah? years ago. Oh, yeah, it was, yeah, it was great. It was um, the, his uh, prison boxing movie, Un Undisputed. Oh, great. and I did it for Sporting News Radio, which you know it's 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 all right for a pot boiler. It's you know not, yeah. not one of his best, but it's it's entertaining enough. This focuses on his noir stuff, the, the Warriors and um, the the Driver. Um, let's see, we also uh, we've got a good piece on Tony Rome. Frank Excellent, nice. the fine Frank Sinatra series. Two yeah. movies are three. Uh, what he did two. Too, right. Two. The men was, was, the set, was the follow up. Yeah, Tony Roman Lady and Cement, of course. Yes. Yeah. And um, my friend Brian Light wrote a terrific piece about comparing the book and movie for Odds Against Tomorrow, which was a movie that we were going to discuss tonight. Um, and then my brother wrote an excellent piece about the movie Frailty. Mm. That's awesome. You know, I can write it off, and I think for our next uh, scene missing session, he'll be getting a new uh, headset as a present from. <laughs> because I, you know, I already did that honestly for Paul Kupperberg, the great uh, DC uh, Superman writer, and so many other things. Because Paul has so many great stories, and we tried to do video, and it just, you know, it didn't. His room didn't work well, and it just didn't sound good. And I'm like. That's a good investment, Paul. Here, there you, right. go. There you go. Thanks for all the great comments. Here you go. <laughs> so, and I'd say the same thing for Hill. You know, he's he's done. Ali did the scene missing logo, and he did a great swamp thing for me back in the day. So it's the least I could do. That we'll make that happen. Um, but Owen, uh, yes, yeah, so you know, yeah. So is there more in the magazine, or did so? Yeah, there's we do DVD reviews. Uh, more at home is what we call it. Um, we also there's some really excellent book reviews usually done by Vince Keenan. Um, Eddie has his letter from the publisher. Vince has a really great uh, dot, dot, dot column where he talks about different various things that go on 
in the noir world and both fiction and so forth. And then Vince also, um, he does a new uh, department that we're doing, which is a kind of short 10 question interview with uh, a writer. And this issue he did S.A. Cosby, um, who just released the book, uh, the novel Blacktop Wasteland. Hmm. And um, he talked to last issue, uh, Vince interviewed um, uh, Sam Watson, who wrote um, the, the book about uh, Chinatown. Oh, okay. Chinatown. I've got that on hold at the library. We were talking about that this morning. Great. Is it the back lot? Isn't that what it's called? Or? No, yeah. no, it's... Um, a big goodbye or something? The, uh, Hollywood, the, hold on. The big goodbye, I think, isn't the big it? Goodbye. Yeah. The big goodbye. Yeah. It is a big goodbye. Okay, the good. big goodbye. And it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that's, uh, I just finished that. Um, I finished that. I mean, actually, the last three books I read were um, was The Big Goodbye. I read a really excellent biography of Marlon Brando. Cool. cool. And then this... It was a make the making of two thousand and one. Wow! Yeah, I saw that one. Book about the making of two thousand and one. I just finished this great. Um, I believe it was Scott Iman that wrote it. Um, this dual biography of Henry Fonda and Jimmy Stewart, really focusing on their friendship. Oh wow! And covered their lives, but also really again that that was the main focus, and it was just fascinating. And I didn't know you know things about certain movies and certain stage productions that Fonda did when he wasn't making movies. And it's, again, we, we see this stuff years after it came out, but it's very interesting to learn the periods where he really didn't make movies for several years and was really just doing stage. And Jimmy Stewart, I didn't realize in the 50s, he started off with Harvey and then didn't make another comedy until Bell, Book, and Candle. And it blew my mind. And I'm like, yeah, it's all the Anthony Mann Westerns and the Hitchcock films yeah, and the Vertigo and... Yeah, I and mean, it just it blew my mind. I'm like, yeah, that's true. He really did. Spirit of St. Louis was in there mm -hmm. with uh, Billy Wilder. But yeah, it just shocked me. You know, the other movie I got when I got that Warner Brothers uh, Mystery of the Wax Museum, uh, yeah. speaking of Fonda, was The Wrong Man, which I'd Great. only seen once yeah. years ago. Uh, it kind of has a bad rap, but I found it very compelling. I mean, it's... Oh, very. I agree, Will. It's, yeah. It's, but yeah, I, I had... For, I only saw it for the first time maybe five years ago, and I was like surprised. Like, why haven't I seen this? Before? Yeah, Watch it's this really movie. good. And it the ending is not, you know, everything is not sewn up neatly in a little bundle. It's but I don't want to spoil anything, but it's yeah, it's it's really good. And I guess it's based on a true story, mm -hmm. and there are anecdotes in that Fonda Jimmy Stewart biography about Fonda meeting uh, the character he plays and the wife. And yeah, very very interesting. Leaving it at that. So, no, I absolutely wrong man. I, all those wrong man, I confess, some of those, le, you know, lesser Hitchcock, yeah. it's like, yeah, it's still Hitchcock. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. Torn well, curtain. You know, and, the, and I confess, you know, he, he didn't even get to film the ending that he wanted. You know, that I didn't know that. that. Yeah, he had to compromise because at the end of the movie, should I give this away? Well, we'll just leave it and say that people should see, you know, is that something that's already like, is it in a supplemental DVD? Feature. Well, I mean, I don't you know. know, but I mean, am, I, I'm going to give away the ending of the movie. Oh, though I realize it exists. Yeah. I don't know if anybody's seen it before. You know, I haven't seen it in years. Maybe yeah. college. No, it's been a long time since I've seen it. it. That's that's the other thing, man. God, when VCRs happened, I was like rabid about watching everything. Oh yeah. And yeah. now I think about films, and it's like, wow, I haven't seen that film in over 20 years. Sometimes over 30 years. Yeah. It's like Jesus. I gotta rewatch that. It's, well, it's even some of the movies that um, that Hillary listed, it was like, ah, oh, shit, I haven't seen that in a while. Yeah. Or I haven't seen that. You know, there were about three movies that I hadn't even seen that he listed. Um, I watched today. I watched um, Intruder in the Dust, just to talk about since we were going to talk about race and, and, and film noir, and Juano Hernandez was in that. You know, that's an MGM film noir, which is kind of rare. You know. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, postman and but it was kind of rare for for them Typically, it was you know a smaller rko and stuff but it's a fascinating movie um it was uh direct i mean it was written by ben maddock who you know did asphalt jungle and uh, and now he was blacklisted he was famously blacklisted and mm -hmm. so was juan over and um but it's based on the faulkner novel 
never and saw Faulkner that. went and saw it. I read that Faulkner actually saw the movie and a guy who didn't like movies and wasn't a big movie fan and he actually liked the movie. He liked it. <laughs> I love hearing stuff like that. It's so amazing. Um, I, oh God, no, I, I was going to mention another movie that I saw recently. Why, well, you know, talking about race and films, uh, last month Turner did that great month of uh, jazz in movies. Oh, yeah. That yeah, Eddie, yeah, yeah. Eddie hosted that. Those mm -hmm. were great. Those were really, really terrific. And, and the guests that he had on were fantastic. Agreed. And that, um, the Belafonte movie was amazing to watch. Um, was that Odds Against Tomorrow? Odds Against yeah. Tomorrow. Yeah, that was amazing. And the and the Sammy Davis movie with Louis Armstrong and God, it was an all star cast. Uh, I want to say Diane Carroll was in it before she was in Julia, was the uh, female lead. A man called Adam, and it kind of was his man with the golden arm. Really? Yeah. I mean, he played a he played a jazz performer that was kind of a jerk, and um, he had a he had a it was a drug addiction, just a basic drug addiction and an alcohol addiction. And am I misremembering that it was Dan Carroll? Maybe it was Cicely Tyson was the lead. But, I mean, like, 64, and it's black and white. Peter Lawford is in it. And it's a it's a very gritty movie. Hmm. And, yeah, that was interesting. I, I love that. Um, and then even things like, you know, they showed that one documentary of the Newport Jazz Festival. I was going to say, the night that went Marcellus was on, they showed the, the Jazz Festival, and then they showed that one short that what had that was very noir like that was the jazz the jazz God, God, that, that was great i mean eddie had called i had talked to eddie the night before that he said you need to watch that if there's one thing you need to watch on this whole thing it's that short of course i can't think of the title right now i know what you're talking i literally just took it off my dvr yeah. i can't remember it either it but yeah great. it was great it was great yeah. yeah well again this is why i love turner man i was gonna ask mike are, are because and is the the film festival, it's it, that's called Noir City when you hit every city. Right, the Noir City Film Festival. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. There we go. Outstanding. <laughs> did you, um, did you pay that? Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's that's my cover. And we, we, so this is the program. This is the, the program that we do. But luckily, the Castro Theater, um, we were able to get that off at the Castro in San Francisco all 10 days. And then... But everything just about LA got canceled in the middle, what? maybe not the middle of it. I don't know how many nights were left. And then, of course, the one in Chicago will. Uh, yeah, we're screwed. Yeah. Go to the I was going to take my father in law because he's a huge noir fan. He watches Noir Alley every weekend. So I said, we'll go, we'll go. But so I said, next year. Yeah. So, I mean, any thoughts to doing, you know, Mike, as we're, as we're broadcasting tonight? Uh, San Diego Comic Con has started online, right. and I'm even involved with a, a great uh, show that's going to happen in August, Mainframe Comic Con. I'll be doing that in mid August. So, any thoughts to taking Noir City online and doing any sort of, you know, panels or anything like that? Well, Eddie did um, recently. He teamed up. You know, we put out our our Blu-ray DVDs of our restorations uh, with Flickr Alley. We're part, we were partnered with Flickr Alley to okay. just create these. Um, I'm lucky enough that I get to design like the packaging. The book wow. Nice. That. And they're nice extras, you know, Eddie does the commentaries and there's doc documentaries that Eddie produces and that the Film Art Foundation is involved with. Um, and I guess it was maybe a month ago, Eddie teamed up with Flickr Alley and through an app, they showed um, one of the one of the films, one of the restorations, um, and Eddie was on there, and he gave a, a little talk, an intro for the movie, and then after the movie was over, he took questions, you know, and everybody had a chance that they could go ahead and uh, comment and ask questions, and so Eddie answered the questions. So that's the closest he's he has come to something like that. The other thing that he's done is he's doing an Ask Eddie. Uh, thing through the Fillmore Foundation's Facebook page. And cool. One like two weeks ago, I would say, that was really good where people had to email in ahead of time um, their questions about anything, you know, about Fillmore, movies, Norali, anything. And he sat and answered questions. And Ann Hawkins, who is uh, 
our, uh, our, our communications director, and she sat asking the questions, and he answered all these questions. And he's doing another one actually tomorrow night on Facebook. If anybody's interested, outstanding. Yeah, um, I I can't remember what time it's on, but if you go to the face, if you go to the Fillmore Foundation Facebook page and you like it and you take a look, you can you can see. And it was really a lot of fun. I wish I could watch it, but uh, opening. Opening day baseball is. <laughs> I've been waiting for this for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can understand, dude. I'm excited this weekend. Uh, the zone is uh, going to finally have some Friday. boxing. Friday, they got boxing. I've been watching. If you've been watching the, um, all right. I don't want to turn this into a boxing thing, but <laughs> it's all good. But, but have you been watching the top rank fights? Oh yeah, yeah. 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 The, last night was pretty good. The main event was pretty good. Last night was good. Last night was good. It was the last one that they're doing, at least in this. Tuesday, Thursday thing. I think okay. gonna, next month they're going to go to Saturdays. At Saturday That's good. Saturday. You know, I got to say, uh, and for a quick tangent, um, pre-pandemic, I've been impressed with the top rank ESPN fights. I think they were legitimate quality. They did their, their bubble very well. And, um, you know, it's very strange to watch. And that was the first kind of like sports stuff, live sports stuff I watched. Oh, you didn't watch any Korean baseball? I I did after after not long after that I was I and I kind of got into it and then I was also yeah, it was fun. soccer. I was getting into Premier League soccer too, so that was the other okay. thing. But, but I have to, and this is going to be my Star Trek thing going back. Okay? Go for it. <laughs> um, so I'm watching the boxing and the way and Will, I, I don't, you probably haven't watched this, but the way they set it up is it's almost like a TV studio. The ring is there's nobody, there's no crowd. And uh -huh. All there is is you got your corner men, you know, you've got a cut man, you've got a trainer, um, and then you've got the people scoring the fight, and you've got the fighters and the referee, and then the cameras. Immediately, what I think of as soon as I see it is the Star Trek episode, and where the Roman gladiators they they go to the planet with the Roman gladiators. Yes. They're filming in the studio the fights and the like. I mean, that's the first thing that pops into my head. That's how much of a Star Trek freak. Like. <laughs> All right, I got the title. That kind of pops into my head, and that that's how I found out about the Star Trek thing that you're doing with Tom. And Tom invited me because I, Tom was I was talking to him the other night on the phone. We were talking yes. about sports, and I said, "Oh, he's oh, you like Star Trek, huh? You got to do this Star Trek thing with us." So. That, but that is the first thing I thought of. I, I don't know if you thought of that too when you watched it. Well, that's why I was starting that's smiling right. and laughing when you said that. You know the title, Will, of the episode? I, I've got it. What is it? Red and Circuses, everybody. Red and Circuses. <laughs> of course. You know, I have a confession to make about Star Trek is I've seen all the movies, I've seen three or four episodes of the series. <laughs> Oh, really? In, in my life. And you know what? But the thing is, like on MeTV, I would flip on and it would just be starting. So I'd watch something like, uh, uh, what's the one with, uh, the? I, you guys are going to know this. I know it's a very well-known episode, but the one with the, the good and evil universe. The, uh, oh, yeah, Amok Time. Amok Time. I watched it, and when no, it was over, not, I'm like, that was incredible. Mirror, that's, mirror. that's not Amok Time. That's um, Mirror Mirror. Yeah, Mirror Mirror. Mirror Mirror. A mock time. Is that the one where Spock? That's the one where Spock goes nuts and is like mating. Yeah, <laughs> I've mate. seen both of those and I really enjoyed them. I'm like, why have I never watched this before? So now I've been watching a few more. But yeah, it's wow. the one like hole in my pop culture two good, knowledge. Two pretty good ones. And Mirror Mirror, I mean, a lot of people think Mirror Mirror is like the best Star Trek. It's ever. really good. And it was a lot more sort of complex than I expected it to be. You know the way that it plays out. Yeah, I love this. I'm so disappointed in the current incarnations of Star Trek because they've taken the smart out of Star Trek, mm -hmm. and it really insults me that. Uh, I, and I mean, I don't mind having female leads and leads of of different races. They uh, and news to the new producers. Star Trek was always about that stuff, mm -hmm. but um, I, it, it disappoints me that uh, yeah, they're they're not as smart as they used to be. Roddenberry was ahead of his time. Oh, way yes. ahead of his time. Yeah. So, oh, Jason, thank you. Excellent, man. I appreciate that. Go Nats. Go All right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Too much. Yeah. No, I'm excited. I'm, I'm, I won't deny. I'm happy baseball's back. That's I, that's I, true. I didn't think they'd make it 
I didn't. I really had my doubts that they'd actually be able to make. I it. hope that yeah. nothing happens to force them to closing it. Yeah, I don't know if they're gonna. I don't. I don't. I don't know if they're gonna be able to make it all the way through. But um, they're not in a bubble like the NBA, NHL, and boxing. Mm-hmm. And I mean, even in boxing, uh, there were you know, I, John, John, as you know, they had fights that they had to cancel because yes. you know because fighters were were COVID. Um, were had COVID, but also um, some of their managers or yep. um, corner men. Yep. Yeah. I mean, they're close and there's fluids yep. flying around and yeah. yeah. Totally. God, I'm sure, you know, Mike and I remember when HIV was, you know, the massive concern and then really scared mm-hmm. the fight business for, you know, a good period of time. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And they're still wearing, you know, referees are still wearing rubber gloves and trainers still wear rubber gloves because of that. And that's that absolutely right. Years ago. That was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. 30 years ago. 30 years ago. Yeah. No, it's amazing. Um, so, uh, no, and as I said, uh, the, I've been I've been really watching a lot of um, what, what's interested me is the period. It's it's you know, the noir period, but really that pre easy writer uh, last gasps of the uh, studio system mm-hmm. in the 50s and 60s when television really was eating films lunch in a lot of ways. And and you think of all these great little movies, and actually that even creeped into the 70s, um, you know, just little movies that there's no way in hell they'd make today, or would they and will they now with streaming? And it's it, I think with COVID and everything, I think it's interesting the repositioning of Hollywood on a lot of levels. And um, I'm fascinated by that. I can't deny it in terms of, you know, maybe micro budget movies aren't going to have a place uh, moving forward with everything that's going on with the pandemic and everything. And did you guys see, is it the vast of night on uh, Amazon yeah, Prime? I watched it. I, watched I like it. that. Mm-hmm. Um, really cool. Yeah. I, it was very interesting. I like that. Yeah. It, it was a great, like first film. I mean, you can see them going past this but it was like like it was a great calling card you yes. know sort of for yeah me. yeah 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 I, I agree well that was it was like a really good first effort for, mm-hmm. for someone you know um uh my that was a movie my brother like really highly recommended to me um, yeah we enjoyed that, that. Um, we, do you guys like have you guys been watching perry mason yeah you know i haven't started yet guys what do you oh, think tell me i like it a lot and you know i never watched the show or I read the books. I watch the show regularly. So we came in. Now, as a fan of the show, do you like this version? Well, I Biker. was. It was a little jarring. It um, is because it, it was a little jarring. He's not a lawyer. <laughs> you're well, one, Perry Man. If you're, have you watched the latest episode? Yeah, yeah, we did. We did watch that. Yeah, so he's a lawyer now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> was he's a lawyer. Like yeah, I said yeah. it's kind of a year one series. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly, John. It's an origin story, yeah. It, it, it's exactly. It's, and that's how, when I finally got to that, when I found, I had already liked it from the beginning because of the, it captured 1930s mm-hmm. LA so beautifully. So. Yeah, oh, it's incredible. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's got an, it's great look. And, um, I really like, um, the guy who's the lead, um, I can never remember. Oh, from Matthew? the Americans, yes. Yeah, yeah. I always forget it, too. Because of the Americans, because I love that show. Mm-hmm. Me, too. I love the Americans. And, um, but this last episode where he becomes, as Will said, he becomes a lawyer. Yeah. Um, really made it me realize, because all the characters from the TV show, I didn't read, the, I've never read the novels, but all yeah. the characters from the TV show are there in name, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, Hamilton Berger and, you know, Dallas Street, there, yeah. Dallas Street, yeah. Street. And I had, I kind of, and it kind of came to me in this last episode that's like, this is, this is an origin story. Yeah. And then I saw that they're going to do a season two. And yeah, it's it just like, was oh, approved, man. I think, today. Yeah. So, right. So it's like, now this is all really making sense. Yeah. And that, I really like it. Yeah. I really, I'm really enjoying it. I love that period. I love like the whole Amy Semple McPherson character, the, the evangelist woman. Yeah. And- Fascinating. That's yeah. fascinating. That whole part of it is like, totally unexpected and really fascinating. And it's not the usual like, oh, she's a scam artist and she's conning everyone. It's a lot more interesting than that. Yeah. Math- yeah. Matthew yeah. Rice, guys, is uh, Matthew Rice. Nice. Yeah, he's yeah. great. Lithgow and Shea Wiggum and yeah. No, it looks cool. I I just haven't made the time to sit down and, and watch it yet. But you know, it's funny. I was actually curious because I had never sat down and listened to the Perry Mason radio show. 
And it was a it was a daytime soap opera, which I oh, found fascinating. But yeah, really? yeah, and it does, and it has no incidental music. It is the it is the driest one of the driest really? old time radio shows I've ever heard. And the narrator is like, "Oh well, Perry's certainly having a problem. We'll see what happens tomorrow." <laughs> and then it goes right into a commercial for Tide detergent. I love it. And it's cracking me up. Yeah, it's a fifty. It's a, it was a five day a week, fifteen minute serial. And unfortunately, and boy, a future anybody famous. Was there anybody famous doing doing? You know, that? I think I want to say Santos Ortega played Perry Mason, who was a great radio actor. Uh, I'll look up the cast. But um, honestly, for a future scene missing, and Mike, you got to be in on this. I would love to talk about old time radio, and and it's. You know, I, I don't know where Eddie uh, classifies uh, if that counts as noir or not. Obviously. Oh yeah, we've written, we've done uh, quite a few articles on it. Uh, mm -hmm. The last one we did was all about um, Orson Welles. Um, Harry Lyme. Huh? Harry Lyme. The Harry Lyme series, mm -hmm. yeah. The, yeah, the we, third man. I can't remember yeah. who wrote the article, but we did a Harry Lyme. Like, we did I love it. that show. That's an amazing show. I I, I think I love Dragman. I love Jack Webb, but I love his noir detective series from like P. Kelly's Blues and Pat Novak yeah. for Hire and uh, Jeff Regan. We, we did the Falcon too. We did about the Falcon radio show too. Sure. No, I love that stuff. I, I really do, and I'm. Uh, I'm 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 fascinated by those uh, shows. It's a great podcast that does all the suspense shows, which is excellent. I really enjoy suspense it. Is amazing. William Spear, the producer, they refer to him as the Hitchcock of radio. Great stuff, and like yeah. a Woolrich stories, and it's like mm -hmm. a lot of good stuff. Sam Spade was good on radio. Uh, Howard Duff. Howard Duff, that's right. Howard Duff with Sam Spade on the radio. And there's a there's an hour long suspense that's a sequel to the Maltese Falcon, and it's called oh, the really? Can. God, I, and, then, I, and Joe, God, we were mentioning Dennis the Menace, the guy who played Mr. Wilson. <laughs> Joe, I can't think of his last name right now, but he played Gutman. Oh, the, really? Yeah, and they got a guy oh, that's see that. Peter Lord, Joe Guy wrote it and everything. And yeah, it's it literally, it's it, like all of a sudden, it's Gutman's looking for another totem like the Maltese Falcon, and it's this, and it's a, it's a real thing. The candy tooth. It was the tooth of Buddha. And it's just one of these rare, like, artifacts and everything that – a pair of relics, I suppose you'd describe it as that, uh, yeah, that's what he's after. And Kemidoff is back. It's fantastic. Nice. Wow. Really interesting. So, too funny. We could wrap up, boys, if you want. I mean, we've been going a good 90. Um, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, but this was fun, though, man. Whatever, whatever you guys want. It's, All right. right. Yeah, Let me show you one up. thing. We mentioned Jack Webb. I wanted to show you this. For Father's oh, yes, Day, my oh, wife oh. got me – this album has both Jack Webb's Warner Brothers music albums on it. <laughs> nice. Try a little tenderness. Oh my god, that's the lead track. <laughs> it's something can I, else. Can I, can I plug um, the new books for the Film War Foundation? Yes, yeah, cool. yeah. Right. absolutely. Right. So this is published by actually Eddie Eddie's Eddie Muller's uh, Black Pool Productions. It's not available on Amazon. How do we order that? Because I want to get one. Black, Blackpoolproductions.com. Yeah. Here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna solo you, solo you out here, man. Where the, how do I do that again? Oh yeah, here we go. Really, really nice book. It's uh, designed by me. <laughs> <laughs> written, hold on, written by. Uh, You're taking it out. Of you. Put it in front of you. Put it in front of you. There we go. Oh, that looks great. Cool stuff. Show the cover again. There we go. Looks great. Scoundrels and spitballers. And uh, let's see. There's also Fillmore Foundation's North City Annual. Gee, cover, tyranny. cover painting by me. Um, God. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, this collects like all the best stories from um, 2019 from the E! Magazine. Excellent. So those, I have um, some of the noir annuals. Those are yeah, beautiful. Yeah, and they are like worth a lot of money because they go out of they've gone out of print. So I've got three or four of them online, yeah. and I looked, and some are going like for like two hundred, seven hundred. Wow! Really? Yeah. That's great. That's fantastic. Crazy. And can we still get them electronically? 
all the magazines somebody put up the website right and all, all of the e-magazines are available yes at norcitymag.com they're 5.99 each uh each issue uh we put links like for trailers and clips also so it's a kind of interactive magazine also uh martin scorsese is a subscriber um that's right. awesome so uh I, I i think it's a great magazine I, it's, you know the film magazines are kind of falling by the wayside and i know that film common is now kind of on hiatus right now so uh, wow yeah just ordered scoundrels and spitballers oh excellent Thanks, can't wait Will. to read it that looks great yeah we'll be doing the um, same when we're done with this uh, broadcast that's fantastic <laughs> No, seriously, man. And it, honestly, Mike, no lie. I, your covers are always eye catching, and I, I love both for for uh, the magazine, but also for Ringside Seat. And I, I just, like I said, your your design for for both are just oh, mind blowing. Okay. And then really, just it's yeah, thank God magazines still exist in an electronic form. And the back I, issue stuff, they look great too. Yep. Oh, so exactly. much fun. Yeah, and you know, back issue is coming back. Um, it's been because of the whole thing that happened with Diamond um, closing down, um, that, yeah. and John was in, John was kind of in desperate straits there for a little. John bit. Morrow, yeah. yeah, yeah, John Morrow. Um, who I, I mean, I've been working with John for like fourteen years. That's amazing. And, and uh, it, the next issue will be back um, in August next month. That's good. You know, we're as again we're recording a San Diego Comic Con going on. I always would save a, a good chunk of change and hit the tomorrow's booth because not only would they have the current issues, but even issues that were coming up. Mm -hmm. right. And I would buy at least five or six magazines to read on the plane back home and everything. Yeah. And yeah, just touch base with John. And John always, like, uh, I'll never for, uh, forget the fact that he let Eric Houston write uh, the comic book podcast companion back in 2006. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I told you, John, I was supposed to design that book. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I would like to see you design that book. <laughs> yeah, man. That's awesome. No, I, uh, honestly, it's again, and now it's, again, it was of its moment. Yeah. When, when comic book podcasts were brand new and stuff. Mm -hmm. It was brand new. The whole thing was, was brand new. Yeah. Yep. So funny. And a lot of those shows aren't, uh, well, a couple of them are still around. Comic Geek Week and, uh, and even around comics has come back recently. It's come back, yeah. So that's cool. Yeah, but John, you're the king. Shut you're, up. You're the man, John. You are the king. <laughs> are you kidding? I mean, first of all, I mean, the people that you get on, I mean, amazing. But also, you're a damn workaholic. Holy crap. Right. Every time I'm on my Twitter feed, it's know, there. Yeah. John, John's, John is at the top live. John's live. He's in the afternoon, in the mm -hmm. evening. He's, he's always there. So you are the, you are the king. Well, thank you guys. Honestly, it's keeping me sane. Everybody says yes, which is nice. I uh, I wish I were better organized because I can take advantage of things. I'll take a moment and promote that uh, Friday night, the Benson sisters and King. I just wanted to hang out, and they're like, "Oh, we should do it like an after hours at a convention, especially yeah. in San Diego." So, opposite the Eisner Awards, we're doing here it comes, John Con. Look at that. Yeah, very, very nice. Very nice. But Tim Seeley drew that for me, which is beautiful. And uh, Franco uh, of Art, Franco and Tiny Titans colored it for me. Nice. I think it's a great demo. Well, we've got a dozen of the creators coming on, uh, dipping in and out as they would if we were all just, you know, standing in the high, you know, <laughs> lobby or in the bar area or whatever, and just, you know, running into people, having them tell us a few stories and then walking away. But uh, we're going to start it off on Friday night, um, 8 o'clock. Uh, Eight o'clock central to so nine o'clock eastern, but I think I might start even at eight o'clock eastern to accommodate some east coast people. But yeah, I've got the dance lot, uh, Chud Winnick. Uh, I'm trying to think, Amy Chu is coming on, Nicholas Scott. Uh, it's gonna be fun, and yeah, it's, you know, it's That's nice. And, and again, I'm just looking for a hangout. They're like, oh no, we got to do it this way. And I'm like, okay, Michael is coming on, Taki Soma. So yeah, it's gonna be fun. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Well, boys, thank you. This is great. I thank you so much. It. Yeah. Hey, come. You know, again, I'll tease the fact that Mike's coming up, but we're going to be doing a Star Trek rewatch of the original series with Tom King and Franco. We'll be the four of us talking about it. We'll probably do at least five episodes at a time. And uh, and Will, you know, um, oh, you know, somebody also in the in the chat, Will, earlier 
uh, acknowledged uh, Hero. Your great, I saw that. Uh, Thank Dial you. Hero run, and also Rivals, which was very nice. Thank you. So, yeah, yeah. That, that's cool. And um, You know, my wife was supposed to color your run on Catwoman. Really? Wow. Because, you know, Ed Brubaker, she did Ed Brubaker's run with Paul Galacy. Right. And um, the editor, I'm trying to remember the editor's name. Is Idelson? Idelson, Matt Idelson. Yeah, Matt Idelson. Idelson. Yeah. And Nachi Castro. Was yeah, and Nachi. Nachi was my editor on most of my run, my direct editor, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, not you. What's your artist on that one? Well, what? Um, it started with Pete Woods, and then it was uh, David Lopez. Cool. So yeah, uh, and they sh right. and, and Matt shifted her to got Batman Gotham Knights. Ah, that's too bad. I loved writing that book. I had so much fun writing Catwoman. It was my run. it's my favorite like experience in comics. I that was time. a really nice. Yeah, your run was really nice. The covers were great. Oh, I, I was at um, a Mid Ohio <laughs> Con. Yeah. Because Adam used covers were great, I, yeah. and I it was like right before we were. I hadn't. I had started maybe writing the first script, but it was still a while before my first issue was going to come out. And I was sitting just by pure chance in Mid Ohio, sitting next to Adam Hughes. And uh, at one point, he just leans over and he goes, "You know, I'm your cover artist on Catwoman." And I'm like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> Jeez, I also love your Aquaman and Sub Diego. That was some fun stuff. I had a, you know, I I had a Catwoman story in that uh, the 80th anniversary issue that nice. came out yeah. a couple yeah. months ago. And and my wife did. There was a Brubaker story that my right. wife, that Brubaker and Sean Phillips drew that my wife colored. That's in there. I still haven't seen a copy of it. They had trouble getting our comps out, and I haven't been to a comic book store in a while. So I mean, I've seen it electronically, but I haven't actually held it. So. I was going to say I've got it on my Comicsology account, so I'm going to have to you yeah. know, and, and reread it. Tell us what it was. What was it about? Um, it was about, uh, it was uh, Pia Guerrero drew it, and it was about, uh, without spoiling too much, Catwoman uh, finds herself at a Batman-themed convention. Everything seems slightly off. Um, Batman, the Joker, Riddler, they're all there just signing autographs, and it just goes from there. It's pretty well, lighthearted, but, fun. you know, I had a great time writing it. And that's it goes, awesome. it has references through her entire history. So That's awesome. It was that's fun. Great. Too funny. All right, boys. Well, seriously, uh, we'll, we'll do it again, and uh, we'll get Hello headset so he can join us. Uh, this time. <laughs> so horrible, because really, we we tested everything out a couple of days ago, and uh, I was yeah. like, that "Sounds great." I mean, what could go wrong? Last time I was the problem, and you know, it's, that's it's true. true. We did, yeah, yeah. Oh, I thanks. jinxed it. <laughs> no, no. So uh, tomorrow night, I'm talking to uh, Greg Rucka about um, the old guard, and also his wrap up to Lois Lane. And we're going to do it late because he's he's West Coast. So it's going to be midnight Eastern time, 11 Central. But I'm a night, so that means that, that's fine. <laughs> I'm okay with that. But and then Friday night, like uh, like I said, it'll be John Con. And uh, <laughs> it'll be fun, I promise. I love it. So, but uh, thanks for joining us for Steam Missing. I hope everybody enjoyed it. And thank you for the good comments that everybody made. Uh, until next time, as I end every broadcast with. <laughs>